Hi there, I'm Rebecca and a really warm welcome back to my channel, Pumpkin Becky. This week it's all about bees, but not bumblebees, not honeybees, solitary bees. Let's get started. I'm going to bet that you have seen bug hotels and bee houses everywhere you go, either on the internet, garden centres, um, big box stores do them as well, like DIY stores, things that look a bit like this. They've usually got bamboo or twigs or something and often they've got a piece of wood that has been drilled out as well. We have currently got 13 of them in the garden. I didn't realise I had to do another quick count up and yeah, they seem to have multiplied again. We've got a mixture of ones just like this and also some higher end versions, although in a small size <laughs> because they can be quite expensive. And we've got some that have been developed differently and they're the ones we're really going to focus on today. There are around 200 species of sultry bee just here in the UK alone. Now they don't form a colony with a queen and workers and grubs all functioning together like a honeybee or a bumblebee does. They don't make wax, they don't make honey, but they are stingless, which is great. So if you've got an allergy to bee stings or children wandering around who might want to have a look at them, you don't have to worry about them and their safety but also they have been proven to be much more effective pollinators than either the honeybee or the bumblebee. I think we got our first bug boxes and bee boxes about 10 years ago now, probably one of the first things we put in the garden. The butterfly box was rubbish, nobody cared about that. Uh, we have a lacewing box, they don't care about that either. But what we were seeing with the sort of bee boxes was that by the summertime, some of the tubes had this really weird like mud capping on the ends. And we thought, what what is that? What is that inside our nest box? Do we need to be worried about it or is it what it's meant to be doing? So we went online, did some research and found out that it is actually the red mason bee, probably, using our nest boxes. In the past we've bought ladybird larvae and we have bought obviously bumblebee colonies to try and help boost our local quantities of these things and we wondered whether as mason bees are so great at pollinating, whether it was possible to buy cocoons or larvae or something or a colony. Obviously you can't buy colonies because they're solitary bees so you can't do that. But do something, buy something in that you can boost your local ecosystem with. And that's when I discovered Mason Bees Limited. They began life as the Oxford Bee Company and were working as part of a research team into the effectiveness of Mason Bees, particularly the Red Mason Bee, at pollinating for commercial crops. Much like you would see uh, American farmers moving huge quantities of honey beehives around to the almond orchards, they were doing something not dissimilar but with red mason bees and boosting the productivity of the area. In 2011 Chris Whittles actually split Mason Bees Limited off from the Oxford Bee Company and created something that is it continues its research into commercial farming practices but it also provides information and supplies for gardeners. He then went one step further and made it possible for gardeners to acquire 
red mason bee cocoons for installation in their garden and they call that the mason bee guardian scheme. We're in our third year as mason bee guardians and I can't recommend it highly enough. Unfortunately the 2020 kit has sold out but do bear it in mind for next year because it's such an interesting good thing to do. At the moment there are three types of kit available and there's a basic price. This year it was £69 and for that you get your choice of tube holder. There's an original, a wooden and also a lodge. You get 50 of the standard nesting tubes and 25 of the refills. You slot one inside the other like that. You get a cocoon release box and March, April, conditions dependent, you will receive a tub with some cocoons in and you'll have a mixture of male and female cocoons. Obviously Mason Bees Limited want this to be as successful as possible so they won't just send cocoons out on a specific date. They will look at the weather forecast and make sure that we're due for an extended period of warmth, sunshine, the right sort of temperatures and conditions that mean that the mason bees will be triggered to come out of their cocoons and fly and do what they need to do because they start almost immediately. Different species of solitary bee use different sized nesting holes these ones are just right for particularly the red mason bee, the blue mason bee and also the leaf cutter bee. So what happens? You're going to receive your kit and you're going to put your release box and your nesting tube holder, whichever one you've chosen, onto an appropriate surface in the garden. And that's either going to be I don't know, a wall of your house, um, a fence, a boundary fence, maybe a, a post of a pergola. We actually use the fence behind us, it's east southeast facing, and it gets lots of morning sunshine, which is fantastic because when the cocoons emerge, it means that the bees can actually get moving much quicker without having to use too much of their own energy that they've stored. When you go to set up your tube holder you will notice that the tubes are different lengths. The wider outside one is slightly shorter than the inner one and when you put them inside your holder that narrow one should touch the back wall of your box and the front edges should be flush. Now don't be mistaken and think that you can actually use these two separately within your nest box. You need them to be together to provide the best protection for the cocoons while they're developing. Also when the autumn comes and this has been capped off by your mason bees you're going to remove the inner and you are going to send it back to Mason Bees Limited for them to remove the cocoons, clean them, check them for viruses and pests and store them perfectly over winter. Then come the spring they're going to return extra tubes to you to replace the ones that you sent back and they're going to send you some more cocoons. And there's no extra charge for that. That is just part of the guardianship scheme. You've made your one-off payment and then so long as you keep returning your tubes in the autumn they promise to send you replacement tubes and new cocoons in the spring. The cocoons contain a completely formed adult bee ready to emerge. It's just waiting for those perfect conditions uh, particularly temperature. It needs about 10 degrees centigrade and better to actually emerge. The first bees to emerge will be the males. 
they're going to go off, forage for some nectar, and then they're going to return to the nest box and wait for the females to hatch. As soon as the females hatch, they will mate, and the female only needs to mate once, and she is fertile for the rest of her life. She's going to live for um, around four to eight weeks. It depends on conditions and it depends what literature you read because let me tell you with solitary bees the information is varied <laughs> I tried to pin down some um, real facts and figures for this video and everything seemed to contradict everything else <laughs> I got so confused but I've done my best to do my due diligence on this one. <laughs> the red mason bee is an opportunist when it comes to nesting sites. It's going to look for things that already exist, that are the right sort of size for it, and again, that face the right directions, that have forage, all these things. So it might be that they're looking for holes in a wall or in the, the mortar. They might be looking at nail holes in a shed and we have had mason bees nesting in our shed before actually going down into the nail holes and laying eggs which is adorable so the female will go into whatever tunnel it is that she has identified as a great nest site and she will inspect it she will be looking for debris she will be looking for pests um, build up things she can't get rid of she won't actually clean a hole out she will be looking for something that is the right size and she will use her body and her antenna to, to check out the size of the hole and make sure it's just what she wants once the female has found her ideal nest site she's going to go off and gather pollen she's going to come back and she's going to come back down the nest tube and she is going to make a pile of pollen scraping it off her body and leaving this pile then she's going to create nectar and she's going to make a sticky blob of nectar and pop it on top of the pile of pollen then she's going to come out of the nest turn around and come back down backwards and she's going to lay her egg onto that sticky pile of nectar. Then she's going to fly off again and she's going to gather mud and she's going to seal off that egg, pollen and nectar into a cell. Then she's going to do that all over again. And again. And again. And again, until she's completely filled the tube up. And then she will form a final cap at the very end of the tube. After about a week inside the tube, the larva is going to have hatched from its egg and it's going to start eating the pile of nectar and pollen that the female has left for it. About 10 days after hatching, that grub is going to start to spin itself a cocoon and it will continue to develop into an adult bee into late summer and that cocoon is going to continue to house that bee all through the winter. It will be a fully formed adult bee waiting to go in the spring. The female mason bee is bigger than the male and also the female eggs are larger than the male eggs. Now this looks like quite a tricky nesting situation. What happens if this bee, which was laid first, hatches before one of the front bees, which you would imagine, you would imagine that there would be a, a set timing for these things to happen. Actually, it's quite different with mason bees. 
they will lay their female eggs first into these rear sections of the hole, whatever that's in, and then the outer sections will have the male eggs. The males will hatch first, and as I said, they will go off neck to forage and then come back, by which time the females who were at the back are then ready to hatch and fly as well. Mason bees finish nesting around June time and that's when you're most likely to see completely filled tubes with the capped off end. But you might still see activity around your nest box and you might see bees carrying pieces of leaf and pieces of petal and they are the leaf cutter bee. They utilise the same size holes as a mason bee does but instead of using mud to, to form the cells, they will actually create little leaf petal shells, I suppose, <laughs> that their egg is in. Their process actually starts a little later than the mason bees and continues into autumn time. And that means that the cocoon won't have had time to actually produce a fully formed bee like the mason bee one does so it will keep a grub in the cocoon instead and once the weather warms up that then develops into the adult bee which flies and hence that's why their whole process is delayed by that chunk. One has a fully formed adult bee by the end of the year and the other has a grub which will then need to do its um, development the following year. This is the original nest tube holder. The original original one is at the front there and it's slightly shorter than the new one which is behind it and you can see that they're the same length nesting tubes inside but one sits back slightly further than the other and that gives a better weather protection. This is a concrete nesting box from a company called Blue and Green. They do all sorts of different sizes uh, including ones which are exactly the same shape and size as a conventional house brick and they can actually be built into the walls of houses. This is our Mason Bees release box and if we take a quick look inside Here is our tray of mason bee cocoons ready to hatch. This is the mason bees bee unit and you can see that as well as space for tubes it also has three drawers. And these drawers have observation panels on the top which means that you can actually view what's going on inside and with this particular unit you've got three different size holes so they will be utilized by three different ideally sorts of bees it's the last weekend in march our nesting box and release box are in place and it's my job now to make sure that the garden is full of things that the bees can forage on once they emerge our neighbour has a small orchard of fruit trees just over the fence. They start flowering about now and my garden is packed with native flowering plants and also non-doubles, non single flowering plants which are best for these pollinating insects to actually utilise. Double flowers a, they're harder for them to get into, and B, they often don't have enough nectar and pollen for the bees to harvest, and that's why I don't grow them. And it's important to have plenty of forage right near the nest site. It encourages the female to return to where she was released from, and they actually have a relatively small foraging area. Again, this is one of these figures that appears to be hotly debated or there's just not enough research or it's really hard to work out how far a bee flies. Mason Bees Limited say that they have a foraging area of about 30 meters from the nest box 
but I also read a scientific study that said they can forage for about 600 metres. <sighs> There's a big difference between 30 metres and 600 metres. I guess ideally the forage will be as close to the nesting site as possible so they don't have to waste lots of time and energy flying looking for food. If you think you would like to get involved with helping support the red mason bee population, get in contact with Mason Bees Limited. Their website is fantastic. It has a really brilliant FAQ section, which I have used some information for this video on. They have lots of information about how best to site your box, how to release your cocoons, everything you could want and plenty of supplies as well. One of the most amazing things about being part of the Guardian Scheme is you can see how successful you're being. They will tell you exactly how many viable cocoons you returned and they will tell you how many cocoons the collective guardianship actually managed to return as well. I think in our first year we had something like 12 cocoons, but in the second year we had, I think it was something like 70 cocoons. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? And it's such a simple process to ship them back and then as I say in the spring they let you know they're about to ship your cocoons back out to you. If you don't want to be part of the guardianship scheme again, just tell them, that's fine. But oh, it's so easy and so fun and you know you're doing something really important for your local ecology and the wider ecology because your cocoons are being spread around all the guardians. And they also have some merchandise on the website, t-shirts, posters, that sort of thing. Back in the autumn, they put a post on their Instagram page, and I think it's possibly on their Facebook page as well, of the new poster they'd had done. And it was beautifully illustrated, absolutely gorgeous. And I said, oh, I would love one of those. But I think I would forever see the typo on it. They had accidentally put Great Britain instead of Great Britain. Oh gosh, I really hope you haven't gone to press on these because, oh, that would just be heartbreaking. And Chris came back to me and said, well, lots of lovely things actually. <laughs> and there's a post saying not all heroes wear capes um, because he was so relieved that I'd spotted it before they had gone ahead and printed them properly. Um, because they just hadn't realised, they'd been looking at this poster for ages and they just hadn't realised that there was this glaring typo on it. So he actually sent me one for free. Bless him. Um, I'm going to open it now somehow. Uh, I love this. I love this Mason B packing tape they got. That's very cool with all their logos on. And I love this as well because it looks like one of their nesting tubes, but enormous. <laughs> this is where I hope he has sent me one that is correct. <laughs> Not a typo one. <laughs> you wouldn't do that to me, Chris. You wouldn't. There you go. Isn't that gorgeous? I love it. And as you can see, it's not just mason bees, it's also bumblebees, leafcutter bees. There's our red mason bee. There's the blue mason bee, who might possibly use our tubes as well. That's a type of leafcutter bee. And at the bottom it thankfully says Britain, not Britain. I'm going to give that pride of place in my house. I love it. Thank you so much, Chris. That's, bless you. <laughs> Some people don't appreciate my um, automatic spell checking. 
<laughs> which just kind of happens. I'm a, a schoolmaster's daughter. <laughs> just they, they, they typos glare at me. Um, but I'm so pleased I was able to help. So thank you. <laughs> Right, well that's it for this week's video. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to rate, share and subscribe to me here on YouTube. And until next time, bye.